everybody, it's me, the student witch. Okay, sorry, my hair is still wet. I just got out of the shower, but I was thinking about the YouTube Pagan Challenge week six question about uh, cultural heritage in your magical practice or in your pagan, neo-pagan, whatever practice. And so I'm kind of skipping over weeks four and five for now um, because I think I'm gonna clump those together into one video. Plus, I'm in the middle of moving, and I, uh, I'm taking classes, so my schedule is all wah, crazy. So anyway, I'm going to start for week six, because that's what I was thinking, thinking about um, in the shower. Um, my genealogy is, okay, my mom's side of the family, they all live in New York, except my mom. She lives in Kentucky with my dad. Um, they're all from New York. Um, and they live in upstate New York in a really small town, a really, they call it a village, uh, in Dutchess County. So upstate New York being anything above the city, you know, the rest of the state of New York. Um, really small town. It was founded in the early 1800s by German, principally German and Dutch immigrants, and its main... Um, its, its economy was driven by cutting ice from the Hudson River and shipping ice. So this was, you know, it, back in the day before the invention of refrigeration. So once refrigeration was invented, you know, the economy plummeted and the population of the town plummeted and it's still a very, very, very small town of, I think to this day, less than a thousand people. So that's where my mom grew up. And so she has mostly German and Scottish ancestry and maybe a little bit of Dutch just because of the region up there in New York. Um, my dad's side of the family is a little bit more complicated. His mother was from New Hampshire. Uh, she grew up in a really tiny town. Um, a paper mill on the river was its main source of income, and she had a lot of, uh, I think, Irish and Scottish ancestry. Like, um, her mother's maiden name was Honan, I think. And, well, originally the family name wasn't Honan, it was something like Hannon or Ohannon, but when they came across the pond, so to speak, from Ireland, the name was changed to Honan. I don't know if they were trying to Americanize it because, you know, back in the 19th century, um, there was a lot of discrimination. 19th and early 20th century, there was a lot of discrimination against Irish uh, immigrants. So, um, so there's that. But then my dad's father is from Eastern Kentucky. He's from Appalachia. So his ancestors, you know, Scots-Irish, um, the Scots-Irish population that um, was the main white immigrant population that went to the Appalachian region. So eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, um, the eastern part of Tennessee, northeastern Georgia, uh, the Carolinas, um, parts of Virginia, like that section of the Appalachian Mountains. So, Scots-Irish, there's some German in there because his mother's maiden name was Gross, like Gross, G-R-O-S-S. -S. Um, but his surname is an English name, and I, I don't know if it comes from Anglo-Saxon or if it comes from, it goes further back to more Celtic roots, but I'm not gonna give it because obviously it's my last name too. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so English, German, Scots-Irish. Uh, so, that's my ancestry. Those are, like, the parts of Europe and later the parts of North America um, that my ancestors and family immigrated to and settled. Um, so, as far as cultural background, the first thing I wanted to talk about was being raised Roman Catholic. Now, um, this doesn't really go back generations or anything. 
Uh, I guess on my grandmother's side, the Irish side, there were more Roman Catholics. But um, my parents converted us to Catholicism when I was in the second grade. Before being Roman Catholic, we were Episcopalian, so like Catholic light. <laughs> um, but being raised Catholic, you can see so many magical practices that are inscribed within the official dogma of Roman Catholicism. And I'm going to mention here a really awesome video that was uploaded yesterday by um, Rodriguez Mystic. Is that his name? Hold on, let me check. Okay, yeah. Um, Rodriguez Mystic. I'm going to include the link below. And the video he made, it's like a 30 minute video, but he's a really awesome um, witch in the UK. And it's about um, magic in Christianity or the subject of Christian witches and his approach. He, he's not interested in the drama and I'm not either. I just like the video because he points out how magical practice is present in all world religions and spiritualities. Um, so, you know, whether it's someone who considers themselves Buddhist, but they also work with ancestor spirits, or someone who um, considers themselves Islamic or Sufi, Sufism is like a a mystical branch of Islam. I don't know much about it, but it's really interesting. Um, so there's that mystical branch of Islam or even astrologers in Islam that he mentions in the video. There's, you know, I mean, just look at all the Catholic saints and the different images of the Virgin Mary, you know, um, the different uses and prayers to the Virgin Mary that different people around the world and different cultural landscapes use her as, I would say, a manifestation of the divine or sacred feminine. Um, so my Roman Catholic background, I think, is a really great resource for me to tap into for my own magical practice. Working with saints, praying to saints as intercessors, praying to the Virgin Mary as this great intercessor this crosser of borders in a way between like the divine and the earthly realm. And I'm that divine earthly split I'm talking from with from within a more Christian perspective, you know. Um, as this kind of she's like Hermes. She's this crosser. She's this messenger. She's hermetic. She's the sacred feminine. She's a mother goddess, you know. Um, and there's just, just practices both within officially sanctioned Catholic dogma, but also within the unsanctioned practices, like more folk practices of different Catholic communities around the world that they're just pure magic. I mean, there's a, I think this might be an, somewhere from Europe, uh, a practice that was carried over here in the United States where if you're having trouble selling your home, you buy, I think it's St. Joseph, you buy a statue of St. Joseph and you turn him upside down or you bury him, I can't remember, but taking that statue of St. Joseph and turning him upside down or burying him upside down or something, that's supposed to help you sell your fat, your house quicker. If that isn't magic, I don't know what is. <laughs> or wearing a scapular a scapular is something, it's kind of like a necklace that has an image on both um, ends of the necklace. One of like the Virgin Mary or the Sacred Heart of Jesus or whatever. And wearing the scapular, it's supposed to protect you. Um, and um, all scapulars or most scapulars that I've seen say, whosoever wears this sacred scapular shall be... Um, shall not suffer the fires of hell or damnation or something like that. So it's like that scapular. I used to wear one when I was a kid. 
And I felt its protective power because I believed in it. I instilled it with protective power. So if that's not a charm, I don't know what is, you know? Um, and the list goes on and on, like working with various saints. And so I, I do incorporate, especially the saints and the archangels, um, I do incorporate some of those images, the candles, the statues, the rosary, the beads, the incense, um, that Catholic upbringing that I had is a huge cultural, I would say, cultural influence on my practice. Another cultural aspect to my practice is my background, my rural Kentucky background, and I've talked about this in previous videos too. Um, I, I, I say I, I grew up in rural Kentucky, and my grandfather was from eastern Kentucky. So just growing up in a rural town, um, having that direct access with the natural world around me, you know, I, like, I didn't know... <coughs> I didn't know really what hiking was until I went to college because I went to college with a bunch of like middle upper class people, mostly white people. So they would talk about like going on camping trips and going hiking, like hiking was something you made time to do. Well, growing up for me, I could just walk out in my backyard, hop over the fence and I'd be in the woods, you know, and I wasn't hiking on a man or human made trail, I was just walking around in the woods in like shorts and flip flops usually, <laughs> you know. Um, so having that kind of direct access to a very rural environment, an environment where there were more trees and cows than people, um, I consider it a very privileged experience and I wouldn't trade it for the world, you know. I would spend hours outside I would spend hours in the woods, off trail, even if there was a trail, I would be off it. I, I knew how to track deer and I have, I don't know, um, if, I ha if I would claim any sort of spirit animal or, oh, Patronus like in Harry Potter, it would be a white-tailed deer, hands down. Um, I, I, you know, I used to go with my dad, um, squirrel hunting and deer hunting. He, I think he would kill squirrel in front of us. I never saw him shot, shoot a deer, but I remember helping him like drag a deer out of the woods. And I remember seeing him take the deer home and then hanging up and drain the blood out and take, well, you take the guts out in the woods to lighten the load. But anyway, um, my sister and I one time convinced him to cut the brain out because she really wanted to see the brain. My sister was really into science and I was just curious. Uh, so my dad cut out the deer brain and put it in a Ziploc bag for us to like hold and play with. <laughs> my mom almost puked. Anyway, so like I grew up eating squirrel. I've eaten squirrel. I've eaten deer. I've eaten, you know, trout, rainbow trout that we went out and caught. Um, I've, you know, I had such direct access to this rural environment in the natural world, woods, fields, deer, squirrel, creeks, you know, I used to play in creeks for hours whenever we went to family reunions or whenever I went fishing with my dad, um, and I would, I would catch, uh, minners and crawdads. <laughs> They're not crayfish and they're not minnows. They're minners and crawdads. Um, so yeah, I know I don't, I don't talk like I'm from Kentucky, but I can. <laughs> I, I kind of had a, the accent trained out of me. It comes out every once in a while, especially when I'm drunk or angry. <laughs> but um, so yeah, and I think the biggest contribution of that background and growing up in that more rural culture in Kentucky in the South was I didn't have to read I didn't have to read it in a book to know that a creek is a sacred space is a liminal space a creek can be a space where like 
different realms or different worlds meet. It can be a boundary. It can be a crossroads. I didn't have to read about that in a book. I got to experience it. Um, another liminal crossroads kind of space in a natural environment would be a field in the woods, you know, a clearing, a holler. So you, you're playing in the woods and then you come across this random field in the middle of the woods and that boundary line between the woods, where the woods end and the field starts, that is a very sacred space, a crossing space where two different worlds meet. I didn't have to read about that in a book. I felt it. As a kid, I just instinctively felt it and I experienced it, you know? Um, so, yeah, and like, so that's more of my personal background and experience in these types of environments, but the culture part is, I remember kids at school teaching me and my dad talking about like, oh, the cows are laying down, that means it's gonna rain. Divination, like divining the weather through the behavior of animals. Um, if you see a ring of mushrooms underneath a tree, that's a fairy ring. You know, that's where the fairies are. And if you step inside that ring, it's potentially dangerous because the fairies could get pissed off and they could trap you in the fairy realm. I remember learning about that when, when I was a kid and seeing fairy rings under, usually under trees. Um, and also spiders. Um, omens and spider webs. There's a specific type of spider who's their legs go like this and this. They usually keep two legs like this and two legs down like that. I don't know if I'm describing this, but it, it has kind of a long rectangular body and it splits its legs like that on the web. And in the center of the web, it always has like a really thick part um, where it uses lots of um, silk and it has kind of a zigzag pattern. And so if you see your initials in the spider web, it's a bad omen. It could mean you're going to die. I was taught that. Um, just all these folk um, ways of reading the land and reading omens and divining the weather. And, you know, a lot of this has to do with hoodoo with uh, kind of Celtic traditions that were brought over by the Scots-Irish. Um, you know, African influence via hoodoo and via, you know, slaves and different, uh, different African, um, African diasporic communities in the South. Like the word goober. I love the word goober. I call my husband a goober all the time. It's a cute, like, term of endearment, but it's also a nice way to call somebody, like, a silly or an idiot. Well, goober comes from a Congolese word, you know, from the Congo. I think it's mguba. It starts with an M. Guba means peanut. You know, goober pee is another way of saying peanut, right? Um, yeah. Um, another part of my cultural background, I guess, going back to the Appalachian part, was uh, just learning to use the land and always having a vegetable garden. My dad and my grandfather, until my grandfather got really old and his Alzheimer's got bad, he always had a vegetable garden. They had, and my grandmother, she knew how to like, she knew how to make her own jams and jelly. She knew how to can tomatoes and can vegetables. She knew how to cook anything. That woman was like, a witch in the kitchen. This is the same grandmother whose tarot cards I now own. So she was kind of into tarot and psychics and stuff like that. Um, but my grandfather, you know, growing up in on a, you know, poor as dirt farm in eastern Kentucky, his mother had uh, 14 children. She had them all at home, and the woman never saw a doctor a day in her life until the day she died. <laughs> so who was helping her give birth to those kids at home? Midwives, Appalachian granny women. 
who was taking care of her children when she was when they were sick who was taking her care of her when she was sick she was she knew what like herbs and home remedies to use like i i wish i could have like interviewed my grandpa more before he you know before his alzheimer's got bad and before he passed away but I remember him talking about a couple times how his, his mother used to make um, like ointments and salves using animal fat and different types of like roots and plants um, for home remedies. So, so like these practices I do consider magical, I do consider cultural influences in my own practice. Yeah, I think I've rambled long enough but this is... Um, this is my response to week six of, um, the YouTube Pagan Challenge about my, the cultural influences in my own practices. Um, so the, the cultural roots in my, my practice. So, yeah, the rambling is over. <laughs> Bye, everybody.